chapter 36. If Elizabeth, when Mr. Darcy gave her the letter, did not expect it to contain a renewal of his offers, she had formed no expectation at all of its contents. But such as they were, it may well be supposed how eagerly she went through them, and what a contrary... Con, con, a contrariety, what a great word, a contrariety of emotion they excited. Her feelings, as she read, were scarcely to be defined. With amazement did she first understand that he believed any apology, with amazement did she first understand that he believed any apology to be in his power, and Steadfastly was she persuaded that he could have no explanation to give which a just sense of shame would not conceal. Sorry, let me go back. I've lost myself. Um, if Elizabeth, when Mr. Darcy gave her the letter, did not expect it to contain a renewal of his offers, she had formed no expectation at all of its contents. But such as they were, it may well be supposed how eagerly she went through them and what a contra contrariety of emotion they excited. Her feelings, as she read, were scarcely to be defined. With amazement did she first understand that he believed any apology to be in his power, and steadfastly was she persuaded that he could have no explanation to give, which a just sense of shame would not conceal. With a strong prejudice against everything he might say, she began his account of what had happened at Netherfield. She read with an eagerness which hardly left her power of comprehension, and from impatience of knowing what the next sentence might bring, was incapable of attending to the sense of the one before her eyes. A bit like me right now. His belief of her sister's insensibility, she instantly resolved to be false. And his account of the real, the worst objections to the match, made her too angry to have any wish of doing him justice. He expressed no regret for what he had, do he had done, which satisfied her. He expressed no regret for what he had done, which satisfied her. His style was not penitent, but haughty. It was all pride and insolence. But when this subject was succeeded by his account of Mr. Wickham, when she read with somewhat clearer attention a, revel, a, rel, a relation of events which, if true, must overthrow every cherished opinion of his worth, and which bore so alarming an affinity to his own history of himself, her feelings were yet more acutely painful and more difficult of definition. Astonishment, apprehension, and even horror obsessed her, oppressed her, Pressed her. She wished to discredit it entirely, repeatedly exclaiming, This must be false. This cannot be. This must be the grossest falsehood. And when she had gone through the whole letter, though scarcely knowing anything of the last page or two, put it hastily away, protesting that she would not regard it, that she would never look in it again. In this perturbed Wait, state mama. of mind, with thoughts that could not rest that could rest on nothing. She walked on. But it would not do. In half a minute, the letter was unfolded again, and collecting herself as well as she could, she again began the mortifying perusal of all that related to Wickham, and commanded herself so far as to examine the meaning of every sentence. The account of his connection with the Pemberley family was exactly what he had related himself, and the kindness of the late Mr. Darcy, though she had not known before its extent, agreed equally well with his own words. So far, each recital confirmed the other, but when she came to the will, the difference was great. What Wickham had said of the living was fresh in her memory, and as she recalled his very words, it was impossible not to feel that there was gross duplicity on one side or the other, and for a few moments she flattered herself that her wishes did not err. But when she read and re-read with the closest attention the particulars immediately following of Wickham's resigning all pretensions to the living, of his receiving in lieu so considerable a sum as £3,000, again, 
Was she forced to hesitate? She put down the letter, weighed every circumstance with what she meant to be impartiality, deliberated on the probability of each statement, but with little success. On both sides it was only assertion. Again she read on, but every line proved more clearly that the affair, which she had believed it impossible that any contrivance could so represent as to render Mr. Darcy's conduct in it less than infamous, was capable of a turn which must make him entirely blameless throughout the whole. Thanks, Papa! The extravagance and general profligacy which he scrupled lay not to lay at Mr. Wickham's charge. The extravagance and general profligacy which he scrupled not to lay at Mr. Wickham's charge exceedingly shocked her, the more so as she could bring no proof of its injustice. She had never heard of him before his entrance into the Shire militia, in which he had engaged at the persuasion of the young man who, on meeting him accidentally in town, had there renewed a slight acquaintance. Of his former way of life, nothing had been known in Hertfordshire but what he told himself. As to his real character, had information been in her power, she had never felt a wish of inquiring. His countenance, voice, and manner had established him at once in the possession of every virtue. She tried to recollect some instance of goodness, some distinguished trait of integrity or benevolence that might rescue him from the attacks of Mr. Darcy, or, at least by the predominance of virtue, atone for those casual errors under which she could endeavour to class what Mr. Darcy had described as the idleness and vice of many years' continuance. But no such recollection befriended her. She could see him instantly before her in every charm of air and address, but she could not, but she could remember no more substantial good than the general approbation of the neighbourhood and the regard which his social powers had gained him in the mess. After pausing on this point a considerable while, she once more continued to read, but alas, the story which followed of his designs on Miss Darcy received some confirmation from what had passed between Colonel Fitzwilliam and herself only the morning before, and at last she was referred for the truth of every particular to Colonel Fitzwilliam himself, from whom she had previously received the information of his near concern in all his cousin's affairs, and whose character she had no reason to question. At one time she had almost resolved on applying to him, but the idea was checked by the awkwardness of the application, and at length wholly banished by the conviction that Mr. Darcy would never have hazarded, hazarded such a proposal if he had not been well assured of his cousin's corroboration. She perfectly remembered everything that had passed in conversation between Wickham and herself right. in what? their first evening at Mrs. Mr. Phillips's. Many of his expressions were still fresh in her memory. She was now struck with the impropriety of such communications to a stranger and wondered it had escaped her before. She saw the indelicacy of putting himself forward as he had done and the inconsistency of his professions with his conduct. She remembered that he had boasted of having no fear of seeing Mr. Darcy, that Mr. Darcy might leave the country, but that he should stand his ground, yet he had avoided the Netherfield Ball the very next week. She remembered also that, till the Netherfield family had quitted the country, he had told his story to no one but herself, and that after their removal it had been everywhere discussed that he had then no reserves, no scruples in sinking Mr. Darcy's character, though he had assured her that respect for the father would always prevent his exposing the son. How differently did everything now appear in which he was concerned? His attentions to Miss King were now the consequence of views solely and hatefully mercenary. Oop. One second. 